Chapter Twenty Five of Camp Fire Girls at Twin Lakes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Camp Fire Girls at Twin Lakes, or The Quest of a Summer Vacation, by Stella M. Francis. Chapter Twenty Five, A Little Scrapper. Oh, you dear little brother, you dear darling child! Almost sobbed Addie as she seized Glen Irving in her arms and began to shower kisses on his unwilling face. The boy shrunk away or into as small a compass as he was able to escape from the affectionate attack. Plainly, it was anything but pleasing to him. The attack, however, did not cease in response to his protest. Addie held on to her captive with all her strength, at the same time attempting to soothe his wrath or fear, or both, with as many kisses as she could force in between the boy's belligerent arms. Glen, conscious of the presence of friends who, he believed, would go to any extreme to assist him, fought as he had never fought before, desperately, viciously. He used his fists and fingernails to good purpose and pulled at his hair until it presented a ludicrous appearance of disarrangement. Realizing that the boy's actions might prove harmful to his cause if this affair should ever be contested in the courts, Miss Ladd decided to take a hand and do what she could to pacify the young heir who had suddenly been transformed into a veritable wildcat. She had no doubt that there was good cause in his past experience for the development of such character in him, but expediency demanded that it be checked at once. Here, let me take him, Miss Ladd urged as she laid her hands on his shoulders and attempted to draw him away. A few gentle words and an exhibition of a kind persuasiveness of manner brought success. She drew the lad back some distance and tried to reason with him, whereupon he burst into convulsive sobbing. His sobs were not a new expression of an outburst of passion. Miss Ladd was certain of this. Little Glen was weeping not because of anger, opened the floodgates of his soul, but because of some picture of dread in his past experience which he feared would be repeated in the future. But Addie Graham was not equal to the occasion. The veneer of gentleness that she had put on could not withstand the deep-seated spitefulness of her nature, and as she observed a severe scratch on one hand and felt the disarrangement of her hair, she yielded impulsively to vengefulness of spirit that was boiling within her and exclaimed, The miserable little pest! Just wait till I get you home, Glen Graham, and I'll... She stopped right there, much to the disappointment of the eagerly listening campfire girls, who fully expected her to open an avenue to the very evidence for which they were looking. Why, she continued, with a desperate effort to control her temper. I never knew him to act that way before. He's usually such a, such a sweet dispositioned little dear. I don't know what to make of it. He took me completely by surprise. I don't understand it. I don't know what to make of it. I can't understand the little, the little de dear. It is strange, very strange, Miss Ladd agreed purposing, for the policy's sake, to help the girl out of her predicament. "'Come to sister, Glennie dear,' Addie continued, after she had succeeded in rearranging her hair and restoring her hat to its normal position on her head. "'Don't you know sister loves you just lots? Why did you run away? Come back home and sister will give you some candy, just lots of it. Come on now.' That's a good little boy. I don't want your candy, and you ain't my sister, and I won't go back. 
You'll beat me, and Mum'll beat me, and everybody else'll beat me. Don't let her take me back. Please don't, Glenn concluded, turning his face pleadingly toward Miss Ladd. Oh, you must go back, Glenn, the guardian replied reproachfully. That's your home, don't you know? Where in the world would you go if you don't go back home? Think of it. No place in the world to go. No place in the world. There was a tone of awe in the young woman's voice that impressed the boy. He cooled down considerably and looked meditatively at his monitor. They'll beat me, he protested earnestly. They'll tie me to a bedpost and strap me. Why, how perfectly terrible, Addie exclaimed. I never heard of such a thing. I can't understand such remarks. I'll tell you what we'll do, Catherine suggested reassuringly. We'll all go back to the house with you and fix everything up nice. They won't beat you, I'm sure. Come on, Miss Graham, we'll help you, if you don't think we're intruding. Addie did not know how to reply and did not attempt to. She started toward home and the campfire girls followed her. Miss Ladd leading the battling runaway by the hand. Glenn was considerably bewildered and apparently submissive during the journey homeward. He said little, and when he spoke, it was only a short reply to something said to him. At the door of the cottage, they were met by Mrs. Graham, to whom Addie introduced them. None of the girls were well impressed by the woman's appearance or manner. She affected the same ungenuine interest and affection for Glenn that had characterized Addie's manner toward him. But they managed to bring about a condition more or less reassuring to the boy and left him, with secret misgivings, in the custody of the family which they held more than ever under suspicion. "'We've got to do some real spy work now,' said Miss Ladd, after they had reached their camp again. We've got to find out what is going on in that house when those people have no suspicion that they are being watched. End of chapter 25